man, Dota's been so hard lately. Yeah. I know. So I haven't hard. played too much. I've been staying up late playing. I've seen you bit. on there. Right. Sorry, this is a mailbag. This episode. is a mailbag. I'm sorry. <clears throat> this is Welcome a mailbag to episode. the mailbag. It's the mailbag. Yeah. It's the one and only mailbag. Oh. We, Tom, Tom, Tom just told us that our, our, there's some drift in our podcast, so our, our audio feeds can go out. I don't know why. Drift. That's a nice term. I like. How that. many Pentiums do you guys use uh, to record the podcast? Seven. Maybe, Oh, right. Okay. Well, mm. I, I use nine, so maybe that's the problem. Oh, maybe you're ahead of us. Yeah. Because of that I've Pentium got, uh, power. A hep- Heptacore A342 quad quad chip nanometer ch- chipset. All right. <laughs> they, yeah. th- it's become hard. I don't know if you've bought a computer recently or at all. It no. used to just go up in numbers, right? Yeah. But now it kind of goes sideways and everything has like... T- an very I or something tell. at the end of it, an A G yeah. or like an X, and everything has like more cores or yeah. more like I don't know. It's just hard to tell what is. I think just they like to switch it up better. sometimes, you know. Like we were just so used to just the numbers going up that they just thought, let's make the numbers go to the side now. And like once they're done with the numbers going to the side, they'll go up again, and maybe they'll go down. You know, they'll do a stat squish. Uh, on the uh, on the stuff as well. <laughs> I understand why, because I think they're reaching. They reached like some miniaturization limit, you know, where right. they couldn't fit more transistors in the same area. So instead, yeah. they're just piling oh, yeah. cores on top of each other. But yeah. I think that could increase the chance of one of those cores failing. Yeah. So I feel like well, this is just less robust. It is quicker, but less robust. I'm maybe, sure there's redundancy. Or maybe I'm talking out my ass. Pretty sure it, uh, if a if a core breaks, I don't know. Maybe it just they just move around it. You know, maybe like having a lane closed on the motorway. You don't shut the whole motorway. You just put an X in that lane. That's true. That's true. Right. Let's get down to it. I've got probably this guy, the... this guy is ready to bag. I'm ready to bag. I've got my you bag. You want to get this mailbag episode done in the next five minutes? No, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've been reading through these this morning. I spent an hour reading through them, handpicking the ones that I think are worth reading. Oh. I, I want to say first of all, several people have asked where is not in the not in the mailbag, but have asked on Twitter where do we send our mailbags um, re, uh, submissions? It's periumflax at gmail that's the email address. I didn't set up a Triforce one. I probably should have. But okay. um, in fact, maybe we should do that. But either way, Doesn't just send matter. them to periumflax at gmail.com and I will I will read them. I, I respond to some that don't get read out, right. which are not suitable for going out because they're just a bit, they're very, very personal and sort of uh, very sweet. Um, or they're just something that would be a, a massive buzzkill, in all honesty. <laughs> so, right. so I just thought, you know, I'll respond to those ones personally and just be like, you know, cheers and good luck and all the rest of it. And quite a few of them are people saying that, oddly enough, this stupid podcast of ours helps them out getting through some tough times and i think you know i don't want to read those out because it feels like wanking yourself off a bit but i think um it's nice to hear and i want you guys to know that it certainly motivates me to keep doing the podcast as much as you know hanging out with these guys it is nice to know that in some small way we're helping people in either their boring filing job and a lot of people email in to say they are currently filing so I, we were dead wrong. The filing is a thing of the past. I apologize. On yeah, no. Half of the podcast there will today. always be filing. You got to keep the you got to keep the workers at work, and uh, sometimes you need really easy jobs for them too. Because if yeah. YouTube doesn't work out, I think if this, uh, I'd love to go back to do some filing. You know, I'm yeah. It's a, it's a relief to know that there's still that's out there. For something well, that, something a, that you can handle out there. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of references to filing in this week's mailbag, but let's get to it. This might be the best okay, opening. I'm not looking for a job okay. actually yet at <laughs> the moment. All right. but. <laughs> this might be the best opening to any Triforce email that we've ever had. Uh, you guys oh, can God. be the judge. This is the first sentence for the email. Right. This is from Miles. I am in prison. Nice. Wow. That's the Holy opening crap. sentence. I live in an open prison, which means that once a month I can go home and catch up on what's happening in the real world, including listening to as much Triforce as I can. Having been in closed conditions for almost four years and hearing your interest in prisons and the justice system, I thought I'd send you a quick email about gaming in prison. Wow. According to your behavior in prison, you can be categorized as basic, standard, or enhanced. Enhanced means Ooh. you don't break the rules and you behave well. If you're enhanced, you can purchase an Xbox 360 or a PS2 from the prison supplier. Their consoles have their innards ripped out so there's no Wi-Fi capability. Right. It's 100 quid for an Xbox 360 and 90 quid for a PS2. No 18 rated games or DVDs are allowed in prison, so the selection of games is limited and old. Many of the PS2 games are so scratched they're, they're basically unplayable. 
They are a great way to keep the prison population compliant and not bored, and although they add to the stereotype that prisons are like holiday camps, bear in mind the average prison salary is £20 a week, which is mostly spent on food and tobacco or vapes. So it takes a long time to save up for a console oh I mean, my God, and games man. if you want them. I don't even think I'd bother with the console. (laughs) I'd just buy tobacco. Yeah. (laughs) That's all I would buy. I've I've kept this short. So if there's anything specific you'd like to know, please let me know. I'm home once a month, so there may be a delay in my reply. (laughs) Oh, and for what it's worth, my crime was financial. It was related to insurance, which is why I'm trusted enough to be able to go home while still in prison. So Miles is not a danger to to anything in particular. Good. uh, Well, well, that was going to be my first question because I don't really want to, you know, talk to or entertain like uh somebody who's done something horrific you know right financial crime don't get me wrong there's some knock-on effects and stuff somebody along the way is getting screwed maybe big time as well but at least it wasn't like gbh or like a rape or something like that you know those are far worse also Um, you know what i'm not being funny but this lad's in prison for financial crime what about those fat cats on wall street eh? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, there, by, by there, there is too, that too. Hey, hey. There is that as well. I mean, they're it's professional like financial criminals, though. They're like sanctions, you know? Yeah, yeah. they're allowed they're like, to be. It's a good point. Yeah, they're like the economic hitmen of yeah. the world. You know, well, they're, they're allowed they're, to... They're big, big boys. They're hard to take down, you know. Like, uh, what, what are you going to do? They, they can pretty much do what they like. But luckily They're for us, they're master loophole exploiters. You know. Yeah. I also think that the those those banks and those guys are so important to the economy that yeah. if they all got taken down the way they they should be. They they know they're basically above the law. We I mean, go, they basically run the show. We go back to having like a potato and carrot econ- economy, exactly. right? Like we just be, be back in the mid- medieval ages. I mean, I'd be in big trouble. I don't have anything that I could trade. No, my my, my precious young body, I guess, would be. Not it. only not only do I have nothing that I can trade, I also don't have any real skills. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of of any description, really. Yeah, so we'd be if, fucked. Yeah, I'd we'd be, be the, uh, I'd be extra fucked. Do you know what? One of the things when my kids go to a horse riding club, one of the things they have to do there is a giant heap of horse shit. Yeah, uh, and they call it. You um, make them eat it. No, <laughs> they have to shovel you have the horse it too shit easy, onto the girls. top of the pile. Horse riding like, club, <laughs> what are you, the queen? Eat yeah, that shit. Eat that shit. <laughs> eat it. You all have to eat two steaming yeah. lumps before you, you get gotta a horse. Eat both, both of those piles need to be gone <laughs> by the time I get back, and if they're not, you're having them for breakfast tomorrow yeah. and lunch and, and if, dinner until And then until lunch done. and dinner until it's done. Yeah. Uh, no, they You've got to like, introduce some hardship onto yeah. a pile and there are two roles there's one at the foot of the pile and then one person has to stand on top of the horseshit pile like patting it all down so it doesn't roll back down yeah it's a pretty pretty grisly uh, job but hey sure. they do that for one week and then the other week they get to ride horses so it's nice but the one so one week th- so you drive them over to the horse riding place and they spend the entire day shoveling horse shit. And yeah, then and the next, cleaning, and cleaning the horses. Uh, oh so brushing the horses, God. cleaning the horses. Okay. Cleaning this the is stables, a huge, shoveling shit. This is a huge uh, component to horse maintenance, though. You know, they oh, don't just, they're not self-sufficient. They, you know, they don't just go around and have a bath when they need one and or take a shower and eat their lunch and, you know, read the paper and then, oh, Katie is coming to ride me for an hour. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, they, there's a lot of work that goes into keeping them exactly. in tip top shape. I mean, they've got a lot of horses there too. Yeah, and I mean, and they can get so many diseases and stuff too You've if you're not really keeping up on them. it. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So I think it's actually pretty good. I also you're... think it's teaching them a good life lesson. Your girls you are don't learning get to fuck about and yeah. just get have fun. You know, you got to yeah. you got to put some fucking graft in there. And shoveling horse shit is a great eye opener. Also, because of all the tasks I had to do, my my eldest, her hands and her grip. Are unbelievably strong. <laughs> like she can, she can. Op- she's popping the lids off jars. I can't open. No Holy problem crap. because of, it's like years of uh, of all that that hard work with your hands. So I'm hoping it's going to toughen up the younger one. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think it will. Uh, either that, or I'll feed her to the horses. She's got like calloused old cowboy hands. She's got so cowboy she... hands. Yeah, yeah, for real. This is all right. This is an email from Jesse. If other things, we got to keep going, Lewis. We got like I got like twenty. Right. Hey, Lewis Fine. is trying to to provide us with a quick anecdote before we move on. We've Let done them... one email. <laughs> Let the man finish just... his waffling. I all mean, right. the amount of effort that you have to go through for a horse. Imagine like. If your car took a shit, you know, you had to like fucking tidy all that up and every week and clean, you know, groom it and like, you know, look after and talk to it. Imagine your stuff too. car just took a big messy shit, like all of a sudden. Just like oily, and it was just turd. sitting there on the driveway and you felt really sorry for it. Like, oh, fuck. 
poor guy. He's <laughs> just taken to the car. He has vet. just evacuated everywhere and <laughs> doesn't even know. He doesn't know what to do. You know, his like <laughs> the headlights are like uh, angled down to like to make sad <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Ooh, he's upset. Anyway, sorry. All right, this is from Jesse. Jesse is a wedding photographer. Uh, do we have any? The, the, at the end of this, we we have to think of any weird, exciting, or awkward wedding stories that we've got. Uh, but as Jesse is a part-time wedding photographer, uh, there's a, a list of things that they've seen that that's pretty bonkers. Uh, a truly ancient grandpa getting figuratively and literally too tipsy and falling over and banging their head. That's fair enough. But this one's my favorite. A drunk uncle giving a speech at a wedding which was going south very quickly due to feuding family members. Wow. He was a, oh, no. a part-time magician and thought it would be a great trick to grab hold of the bridal party's tablecloth and yank it super, super hard, leaving all the plates and cups standing, except he balls it up, spilling food and booze everywhere. Uh, he looked at this mess, shrugged, and said, at least everything was fucked already. And apparently the couple only lasted three weeks before they Oh, come out. on. That's oh crazy. God. Do you know what? Have you guys I, been to I, any bad weddings? I have. I've, I've only been to a handful of weddings because most of uh, most of the weddings that my friends had were, were in Canada around the time when kids were, like, my wife is pregnant or kids are being born or whatever. So I actually missed, like, a ton of weddings, mm. which I'm kind of thankful for because uh, the, the the ones that I've been to have been really fucking dull. So it, having to go to more of them would have been yeah, I love I love weddings. Yeah, I good. love weddings. Good. Um, well, someone's got to love them, I guess. The, the, the issue is if you don't really know the uh, the people involved, that's those are the bad weddings. I've been, to a, I've been to a few weddings where I only knew, like, two or three people there. And one of those people was either the bride or groom. So they're busy. Yeah. And then you're basically, I'm with Mrs. F. So it's just us and like people I do not know. Yeah. Uh, for the whole length of a wedding is a long time. And you end up having the same boring, oh, uh, man, how do you know, know the bride and groom conversation? And what small do you talk. do? How God, did you they, get have, here? they picked a good day for it because the weather's <laughs> exactly. nice. And, yeah. 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 Lucky. No, it was meant to rain later, but apparently it's, yeah. uh, it's played up. Yeah. No, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. The, the don't, old... don't they look lovely? Oh, they look lovely. Yes. Yeah. I oh, can yeah. fill two hours with weather talk so easily, you know? Oh, like, it's the British way, mate. That's yeah. what we, that's where we're amazing at it. Yeah. We are. There was a lot of that at Dr. Simon Clark's wedding. Um, did I tell you I went to that? No. I, was, I, went, I went down to, to Evan. Uh, for the for the on the Saturday, lovely su summer day, nice. months ago, nice. Um, and yeah, he 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 had a whole a whole mix of people there. I think this is what you get when you are more socially inclined, a doctor than, than me, and a, and yeah, and and so there were just tons of tons of interesting people there to talk to, and I, I wasn't like it was a Any young meteorologist. Crowd as well. <laughs> um, there were obviously the, the standard family members, you right. know. Um, but but there, I don't think it, either family was too extended with guests that, God, you know, all the people who were like, oh, who are all these, you know, you bring in all these extra hangers on that you don't really know. I'm not a, fo a fan of that, really. The, 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 the extended family that you haven't seen ever sometimes. Oh, my God, know? yeah. I'm not going to invite someone to my wedding that I've never met. My I have God. cousins that I've never met, and I have uncles that I've only maybe met like once or twice in my life and stuff as well. Like, it, yeah, if I can't picture their face in my mind, I don't think wild, I want them yeah. at my wedding. Yeah, be, you've got to be crazy. Yeah. Some hey, uh, think, on the topic like, of Doctor Simon Clark, I saw him recently. He was in Jersey for a couple of days. Oh yeah, and yeah. I went to meet him at the zoo. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I nice took my family to the zoo and uh, had a chat with him for like 20 minutes and then uh, carried on with my fun packed day of, uh, you know, Zooing. hurting, hurting you children around the zoo. Having his own family or not. No, what, I don't think so. I didn't really, I didn't really expose to him too much to uh, to the old family, you know, like I just uh, just uh, gave that knowing nod to my wife, like, have fun. I'll be back in 20 minutes. I'm just going to do something that doesn't involve children. And she looked pretty jealous. And then uh, I went off and talked to him while he was, he had to go around and take some pictures of like animals and stuff. Because he was doing, he was working. He was like doing some stuff up there. So I just uh, was asking him about what he was doing and, and stuff and asking him what he thought about Jersey and everything. And then I left. <laughs> That was it. Sorry, the, the, <laughs> the story is not exciting. But it, this, no. uh, I think I think he's uh, like one of the first people I've seen since, um, since COVID. Well, I, I mean, mm. I've seen you, but I, I don't think I've seen anyone else from like the network or the office or anything he's such a genuinely nice yeah. man he is yeah he's really um, nice yeah yeah so i had to really the wedding was like super super well done i've been through a lot of weddings partly because i used to work 
at a hotel that did weddings. Right. And so I would I would be a waiter and we do like four weddings a weekend, you know, two on yeah. Friday, two on Saturday kind of thing. God. And they were all like carbon copies, basically, of each other. Well, I think there's kind of a playbook for weddings, right? Most people yeah. know that they want roughly the same thing as the next person. Like people don't change it up that much, right? But that's why I think the the people that are there is what's most important. I mean, I, I know that all the weddings I've been to, it, it's the people. Like you can be in a wedding with the most unbelievable setting, but if you and you know that if, if I knew all these people and it was my family, this would be amazing. So I think that the the although weddings are very similar and the when you go to them, you you know what it's going to be after a while and and it, you know it's nice. When the weddings deviate too much from that, you feel like yeah, it, it's like you're in some weird experiment and you're not okay. sure how it's going to turn yeah. out. You just hope it all ends up well. But I, I think just keep it nice and normal because the main thing isn't. That, I mean, once you've got done the ceremony, all that kind of stuff, it's like that. Those details are so minor. Yeah. The main thing is hanging out with family and friends and celebrating the day that's the big thing don't worry about all the yeah. fucking details like oh i want the flowers to be exactly the right shade of red no one's going to give a shit you're not going to give a shit once the yeah. wedding starts the food has to be good and the people have to be good it'd be done. cool if yeah it'd be cool if they could uh use technology to just like superimpose the groom and the bride's bodies onto say like some old footage of like you know uh charles and diana getting married or whatever right but then broadcast it on tv as well so you could just watch it on tv so you feel like you're watching a big fancy royal wedding but actually it's just like pete and deborah <laughs> from down the road get married um <laughs> but you know what i mean but you get to you, you get to watch it from the comfort of your own house you know you can phone people who are also watching it if you want to to say like wow have wow, did you, you see Deborah's veil or whatever people talk about you know right. what i mean like i feel like i feel like I feel that like would be like the for, most miserable dystopian version of weddings wait, for this for this upcoming generation though they're gonna want something like that for How sure terrifying right? people sad. don't want to socialize much anymore people don't really want to meet up with each other in public spaces anymore that, either i don't think that's true dude i, I think don't that's know actually, man i saw my, some footage of people going opposite. to to a disco and listening to headphones and it was all quiet in the disco. Right, but that, that's because they that's have a, what, thing, a silent disco so you can yeah. listen to what music you want. You can do that. The thing is that those people are quite outgoing. They've actually gone outside to a disco. Yeah. I mean, it's only us that are the shut-ins. Uh, I was out giant... last weekend. Okay. I went out on last weekend. I don't weekend. think that those people out. took it in their stride leaving their house to go to that somehow. I bet you it was like fucking, you know, seat of their pants, like fucking anxiety <laughs> overload, everything. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, it, you're right. They are all stressed there's out. There's probably but, finger marks like uh, on their door. Somebody had to like pull them out, you know, like uh, But people marks. are getting married later now. People are getting married in their 30s. And by the time they're in their 30s, they've come out of their shells enough to do a wedding that is probably low key, but yeah. traditional. The thing is, like, it's not usually people, it's it's rare to find a couple that are both completely introverted, you know, because how do they yeah. meet each other in the first place? Mm, <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah, like, that's it's true. like a two million to one chance that they'll yeah. go outside and meet someone. No, I don't think me or my wife joking. are particularly extroverted either, but I think we no, had the benefit no. of meeting when we were younger. But I think that the, the social pressures of family and friends and other things force you to do a a normal wedding, right? Because yeah. most people have normal lives, normal jobs, normal family, and this. We that. had a we had a pretty normal wedding. Flax, I'm assuming you probably did too, right? Did you get married like in a church? Yeah, and I stuff? mean, we, we were yeah. 25 when we got married. It yeah. was uh, not a church wedding because we're we're not religious people. No. And uh, so it was a town hall uh, in Wimborne in Dorset, and we got married 2001 September the first. Oh, nice. Uh, just just before 9/11. That was when we were on honeymoon. Oh. Uh, so the world changed before the world changed. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, we were partly responsible. Do you were, do you recall? Were you able to take like a two liter bottle of coke were onto the plane? You Al Qaeda? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jesus. No, no. But the, the security about them was very light. I it mean, was la you know, it was pretty it was, lax. Compared, they were just like, like "Do yeah. you have a ticket and a passport?" Yes. Well, then get on. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like very little in terms of searching. Please bags. don't smoke too much on the plane. We um we actually got yeah. married in a church, but it was at um because it's such a small place. Uh, it was uh, like, we're not religious either, but it was a bit symbolic because my wife's um, family, like previous generations of her whole family are all buried there. Oh, so right. it was just like, you know, yeah, it's yeah, kind of no, like, it's kind of yeah. like a family church if you like, but 
none of us are religious whatsoever, but right. occasionally we will go up and just like, you know, see some of the uh, the headstones for like, you know, her grandmother, grandfather and their their parents and whatever. Like there's a whole whole there's a whole bunch of them up there. It's not like it's not like a tomb or anything. They're just out in the open. But you know what I mean? It's like yeah. I, I think because it's a small place, you get you get an element of that. So we got we got married there. But it was nice though. It, it was it's a nice setting to get married in. Like I wouldn't yeah. want to go there every Sunday and sing songs and shit like that. But God. you know, for for a wedding, I think I oh, think it's very, church is pretty they're great. Very yeah. They're yeah. very It's scenic. an old yeah. ass church too, really old. And right. it was such a hot day. It was kind of nice to be in the church. It was nice and cold inside. It's like you don't even need air conditioning in those bad boys, right? There, there you go. Yeah. All right. We got an email here. This is about the uh, we we really opened a can of worms when we talked about jury duty. Oh, because shit, I've yeah. had so many emails about jury duty. People take justice very seriously. They do, but also because obviously so many people get called up for jury duty. And it's, it's an interesting thing to be called up for, although for most of the emails I've got about it, it seems like it's also incredibly boring <laughs> most of the time. And there there haven't really been any positive. Yeah. Uh, there have been a couple of positive emails about Judy, but most of the you're time not, it's, like, uh, you're it's not, like this one. You're not doing the OJ case every time you're getting called no, for jury no, no. duty. But, so. but even if you were, that's months and months and months of your life oh, sequestered yeah. and, and all the rest yeah. of it. Anyway, this is from, I don't know if it's Taylor or Tyler, but it's it's T-A-Y-L-A right. has emailed in. Um so uh, this is about three years ago. Ride to the courthouse at 8 a.m. Emailed three years ago. Holy crap. No. <laughs> this is the jury duty. You've been I hanging on to that one. Yeah, I really. I was waiting for just the right the right episode. I arrived at the courthouse at 8 a.m., went through the security checks and metal detectors, ushered into a large room with other potential jurors. They called the first round of jurors to get screened, and the remaining jurors had to wait in case they were chosen. Everything had been going as expected until a bailiff, who I can only describe as a jolly Huel Babano. And he's the big lad on Better Call Saul. Yes, yeah. Right? Had walked out, looked around, and said, okay, let's get some entertainment for you guys while we wait. He then proceeded to play an episode of Seinfeld. Nice. Amazing. Sounds After the good. episode ended, the bailiff returned to say, okay, everybody likes dinosaurs, and then put on the Jurassic World movie. At this point, <laughs> I became very enthralled with the movie as I'd not seen it yet. About three quarters of the way through, at 11.45, the bailiff returned again to say they were all set and we could leave. I was quite annoyed, not only because I'd had to eat a parking ticket by knowingly parking where I knew I'd get a parking ticket, sitting in a room full of strangers who were essentially wasting four hours, but for the fact the movie was cut short and I had to purchase the movie later to finish it as I needed to find out how it ended. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. Jesus. It is ridiculous. I guess it's like treating them like little kids, like yeah. putting Frozen well, on is. or whatever. Putting a movie on. Yeah. I mean, it's just hilarious. I mean, but Seinfeld into Jurassic World. Like, if you know in the old days going. when my mum always tells me you'd go to the cinema and there would be three movies. Like when people talk about a B movie and stuff like that, that's what they mean. Is like you'd have there'd be like some kind of little serial, like a twenty minute bit, like The Lone Ranger or something, uh, or some little you know Batmany kind of um, you know Kicked Crusader thing. Then they'd have the B movie, and then the main event, the big picture at the end. So you'd go in and you'd pay your money, you'd be there for fucking hours. You'd be watching like three separate programs. Yeah, uh, when you would go to the to the movies. Which is fucking amazing value for money. There was about fuck it. all to do back then, though. To be fair, yeah, so no I think TVs. People yeah, what were are you gonna quite do? happy to do that, right? I get the sense, and you could right? smoke like, in there and everything, right? Oh, like, God, these yeah. guys are bored in the jury room. You should keep them entertained. But I would bring a book with me to these things. I wouldn't want to have to be forced to watch Jurassic fucking World. Yeah, or Jurassic World. They, they could. They should spice it up a little bit. Like you, they should do like some of those kind of old Fallout style infomercial things. Like, so you've been selected for jury duty and like uh it takes you through like uh are you ready to administer justice and and stuff like that do it for your country they should do one of those yeah that would keep your you voice is perfect for those actually thank you no. thank you very much <laughs> i say get troy mcclure in hi yeah. i'm troy mcclure and welcome to the do's and do not do's of jury duty. Yeah. And then do do like that. Exactly. Why, I think why limit yourself to just like the courthouse as well? Like you could have one like, so you've been incarcerated, you know, like a, <laughs> like a nice, nice uh, introduction <laughs> to like your up. new life. <laughs> Welcome to your new life behind bars. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you could have those yeah. things everywhere. I, I think, I think it, you should. Yeah. I think it would make I life a lot more interesting. There's that Finnish video you can look up where it's how to open a door correctly. Have yeah. you seen this one? No, I have not. Oh, you got to look it up. It's like a Finnish instructional video on how to use a door because apparently most people are doing it inefficiently. So this is like a, a video about how to use a door. I cannot tell if it's a parody or not because I was laughing too much. Yeah, yeah. Even when you go to like the it, to the lawyers, like, so that hussy cheated on you again. Uh, right. You, like, <laughs> It, it, it could be anything, right? You could go yeah. like to the car mechanic. So that piece of shit broke down again. <laughs> like, you, you could just you could. There's so a whole good. industry. I'm sure yeah, there's there are a whole tons industry of around these little infomercial things. So maybe yeah. I should look into this. So you've had a good time riding a horse, and now <laughs> it's time to shovel the shit. Now the it's shit time shovel. to get real. Horses <laughs> cannot take care of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was so good. Uh, All right, here's I, one, so here's the guy, one from... we didn't Sorry, go just, on. Just we didn't have any questions for the guy in prison. First of all, I'm interested in how, did he, I guess he must have had some sort of trial. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, what are the level of the other do you know what crimes other ki people Oh, the kids, I was going to say. Right, so yeah, here's, if, here's a children. couple of questions. Do you ask, is it is it the done thing to talk to other inmates about what they're in for? Right. Um, it, how, given that you're in an open prison, is there any violence? Are there, are there still a few nutters about? I mean, because yeah. I assume if, you, if you're in the open prison, you fuck somebody up or jug them or something, you're going to leave the open prison. Like, in a way, by not, having not an open prison... Not only that, prison, but you're, you're, you're making yourself, uh, you're putting yourself into the frame, onto the grid, right? You, if you do something like that, then people will notice you. And I think you want to yeah. be not noticed. But this leads into another thought I had. How do you think uh, wearing a kimono no full time in prison would go down for you personally like do you think people would think that you were insane and leave you alone or do you think that they would just beat the shit out of you all the time because you're wearing a kimono I don't, I don't think they get to choose what they wear mate I think they get prison uniform to wear well what about a, like a, yeah you can have the prison uniform but surely you should be able to drape yourself in some silk I think or only the leader of the biggest gang will be wearing a kimono yeah I mean, I mean come on like you gotta get a house coat or something right like uh, it no, would, I don't it would make practical sense choice. to have a house coat in prison because they could save like on the heating slippers. bills right I don't know yeah. what a house coat is brother I'll be honest with you you don't know what a house I, coat is is it a dressing gown yeah oh yeah house like coat a, yeah yeah Let me look that up I've never it's heard of it. It's a dressing gown. It what is. I, the context clues were there. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm, I, I'm just interested in knowing, like, <laughs> house coat. What, we obviously get it's like, like an this NA very. Thing, I think. I always do it as a house coat. First of all, what country are you in, and what level of prison is? I assume the lightest one, and I, and then like, what what jobs? Yeah, if are you you're in like do? Norway or something like that. What's the food? I like? don't think that prisons in Norway are particularly what do you, what bad. Do you right? Eat? How give, it, give us your average it? day. What are your hours? Yeah, like, I feel like what, in what, Norway, what if you're in prison, you all you're doing all day is making like spaghetti bridges and uh, <laughs> laughing at somebody's for their spaghetti bridge breaking under too much right. tension. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like some, it's like some intellectual uh, battle or something there. Whereas, like you know, in England, it's like just like jugging and like, mate, you you want me, Nigel? Like it's you know, it's it's rough. <laughs> I've had like eight emails about the name Nigel as well. By the way. We'll get to those in a bit. Although right, I think we're going to run out wait. of time. Do you realize uh, we had a lot of Nigels listening? So many. Shout out. So shout many. Out. That's today's Nigel. Shout out. Nigel. Nigels. Uh, here's, a, here's a quick one from Joshua. Or Josh. Right. In San Francisco. Oh. Uh, has a problem for us to solve. It's a simple one that I think we can all relate to. How can it be that I simultaneously love video games yet can never find anything I want to play? That is the story of our lives, I'd say. Uh, you're spoiled often. for choice at this point, my friend. Uh, it's uh, it's the exact same uh, sickness as browsing through Netflix or Amazon Prime. Or we've never had so much stuff that we can do, um, yeah. and it's impossible to then find something to do because there is just too fucking much stuff. You know, back in the day, you rented a, an NES game for the weekend, and that was the only game you had. So you played yeah. it, and if you yeah. hated it or were sick of it, you went outside. The life was so much simpler then. Now it's just like, I hate this one. I'm just going to browse my library of 10,000 titles, um, <laughs> see what I feel like playing. And it, it just becomes like the pirate memory game. You know, I want a colony sim builder, but I want something that, you know, uh, has some RPG elements to it. And so then you're you're whittling down uh, this list of games, and, and then suddenly you realize, hang on, nobody's made this game yet, but you're too lazy to make it yourself. Yeah. Mm. 
This is the problem. So, there you go. There's yeah. your answer. My uh, suggestion is, go on, mate. is Sorry. just you have to create like some sort of artificial goal for yourself, right? Like play a new game every day. Yeah. I, feel, oh, I feel like that God, one worked really that. well for no, me. That's it did, a, you did, you did that. that for ages, actually, didn't you? The I think, ultimate. yeah. You know, what it's, you know what it's nice to have is like a filler game, like, a, like kind of a time waster game that, you know, you still get that like gaming fix, if you like, but it's not something you're massively invested in. And then you use that to sort of ride through... Um, before Parts of Iron 4. Other and stuff try, comes try, out. Yeah. Try to achieve different things. Grand different strategy nations. games are really good filler for that because yeah, there's agreed. tons of like, especially the Paradox ones, like uh, Europa Universalis, CK3, Hearts of Iron, all those games, Stellaris even. There's so many different ways that you can see a game through and win or yeah. lose or there's achievements was, yeah, that like, you can try the set challenges. Your own thing, for yeah, sure. yeah. Set your own really thing, easy your own to, to just get stuck into one of those and you know. Agreed. Or take up chess. Like our next uh, our next email is from Mikey. Don't do that. No, don't well, do was, that. I, I, so the market it, is saturated. Your episode, You're never going to get good. Wanted to supply some additional <laughs> context as to why Hans Neiman is assumed to be cheating. This is the lad with the vibrating thing up his butt. This, right. That was the suggestion. Right. It really comes down to chess engines, which are computers that analyze chess moves and determine how close to optimal a player's moves are. A computer would, of course, always make moves that are 100% optimal, and while it's not unheard of for grandmasters to approach or occasionally hit 100% optimal, it is very, very rare. Magnus Carlsen hovers around 70 to 72% optimal. Bobby Fischer was around 75% optimal when he went on his legendary 20-match win streak. Hans Neiman, or Nyman, has had multiple 100% optimal matches, no. including one where he made 45 engine-perfect moves in a row. Also, big surprise, the match in question that Carlson accused him of cheating during, he had 100% optimal moves. So, But I don't understand uh, how having a vibrator in your ass gives you the edge. Like, what, I don't know if it was that. What is somebody but, sending you a signal to say, move your castle here? Like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand where the cheating comes from. Like, how, how does this benefit You, you just described it. What are you talking about? You just described but it. But you're just sitting there looking at the board and you're good at chess. Like, can you not? You He's not that good. Right. He's, so he's, he's not, think, he's not so what... good that he can beat Magnus Carlsen. Oh, very few people I get the impression can. that it's like, do you remember that stuff with Dream or whoever who was getting like, or was it, or that, that, that streamer who was basically doing Minecraft, but cheating speed running yeah and they right. got like super lucky and they did the math and they said like you basically shouldn't be getting this many spawns of this thing it's math it's a mathematical impossibility right. it's like a one in a hundred million chance that this has happened for you because you know there's a one in eight chance this thing will spawn but you've got it you know every time eight times in a row so it, it's just impossible right yeah um and so that was the, I, I guess i think that's a similar thing to this hands and even thing like is he's just too much of an outlier um with his move move styles um compared to like the optimal inverted commas moves but this is the world we live in now you know maybe play a game that you know um isn't isn't like solved you know <laughs> maybe chess isn't solved but do you know what i mean it's um it's certainly something that is the computers are better at so like why are we bothering why are we interested you know yeah play like poker this, this, that's the machine well, isn't there been poker, some are cheating they? in poker recently as well there was a girl that was apparently made a call that nobody else would ever make but then she won oh, and the guy yeah, I, th I thought we talked about that was but, um, just like dumbfounded at the play and it was so most most the the is, experts agreed that nobody ever would call there but she did no, so they, no she so, thought they were cheating she they thought she was cheating that she she basically didn't have a hand right she she had like jack high and he had she was winning because she had a, a higher card than him. I think he had an eight nine. Uh, I think. But he had me... the he had the the components to make a straight or something. He could have made, made a straight. Yeah. So straight. he was on for a straight flush. Actually, he yeah. was on for it. But she was technically ahead, but only by like five percent. Right. Like it was a, it was a super super marginal hand. Now, some people are saying she cheated, but for her to cheat, she would need to call him, which she did. On the turn, I believe, which was when it when she called him. So she still has more or less as much chance of losing as she does of winning. Right. It's really not a good time to call 
And for it to be so such a big and obviously high profile hand, it's televised. It would be the stupidest thing ever to cheat in that spot for so many reasons, not least because it would obviously look like cheating. If if he had apps, if he just had seven high and she had eight high and called it and there was nothing out there potentially, then I would send this. And she waited until the river to call this all in. 100% chance she wins and then she calls. That might be considered cheating. But th this, would, this would not only be extremely unlikely that she would cheat because it would be too obvious, but also it's such a terrible spot to cheat. That's the one thing that I think nobody's really noticing is why would you fucking cheat in a spot where you're still barely better than a coin flip? Yeah. It's ridiculous. So no, she was not she was not cheating. This Hans Neiman thing looks far more like cheating if this engine stuff and 100% perfect moves. In that regard, I can see why there's actually grounds to suggest there might be cheating. So you but think that this, this guy's hand, dildo no is hooked up to a computer and the computer is sending him uh, like Morse code vibrations via dildo to tell him what move to make. That, well, that was a suggestion that it was some well, so, kind of vibration so she, thing up. His so butt. she had a so she had this big ring on her finger, right? And people are claiming that that is a vibrating thing. Right. But I think I think it's mad. So what they did was they looked into this um, scandal quite deep, and they fa they did find one thing: one of the um, staff members actually stole. Fifteen thousand dollars of chips. Yeah, off of he the was table. taking chips off the table. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Like they, they found that like that was nothing to do with this. But when they looked back at the footage, they were like, "Did he just take chips from the table?" So they caught another, another, an actual crime taking an place. Actual cheat. An yeah. actual yeah. criminal. This is, you know, you, <laughs> stealing from her. They, they, yeah. they spend all this time rounding up the mafia and throwing them in prison and stuff. At least when they ran the casinos, none of this shit happened. Right, like get them back yeah, in, well, get them back get in, around, bust them out. The Come on, guys, we off. need you. It's like when they incarcerated the Ghostbusters, and then they realized, hang on a sec, <laughs> we need these guys. Let's get them back oh, out. Man. Hey, hey, Bobby. And so, of course, the next theory that came out was that this guy who'd stolen the the chips was actually taking them as payment for giving her the information about the other guys' oh, chips. Oh, bullshit! Somehow, bullshit! Right. Because of course the internet is full of these people who are looking to, to like basically prove themselves as some sort of genius detective and have solved the case. That's what I do you know, on my stream every, every Reddit day. thread. I'm a, you scroll down, I'm there's some prick with a brilliant idea, you know, and, and then everyone is convinced of this. Like everyone jumps, everyone, everyone loves a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Right? yeah, I'm just as bad coming up with them. Like you know these stupid sideways ideas for why stuff is but do man you, do you think that there's a bias in the media lewis uh, no i think there's just bias in humans interesting like, well then wait because our next email might right. change your opinion oh because this is a mailbag what a episode. segue holy crap i know thank you well thank done. you this is uh I, i'm not i can't reveal the name of this person or or specifically where they work i i, I <laughs> see an email but i'm not going to reveal my sources on ted this forsyth from twickenham <laughs> he's written into himself to own yeah. the Dear other Perian, members. AKA the best member of the Triforce podcast. Side period. Uh, <laughs> hi Perian. Uh, I'm a university student currently interning with one of the major Sunday news shows here in the States. Last week, I arrived in the morning and flagged that we had something wrong in the notes and script for the show. Specifically, we said, President Biden accused Russia of a deliberate act of sabotage in the explosion of the Nord Stream pipeline. In actual fact, Biden still has had not said Russia was responsible, and no other major news outlets were reporting it that way. When I brought this up to an associate producer, they tried to fix it, but the two top producers told me it was an editorial decision and not to change it. The associate producer and I were not happy with this, but I haven't done anything else. Despite this instance, as a whole, the people on the show are, care a lot about setting their biases aside and presenting things fairly. Uh, and he's asking for our thoughts on this. Still not sure how seriously to take it. And is it as grievous? It's not as grievous as other lies put to the press. I've been told I'll need to carry some dirty water sooner or later if I want to work in the press, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to. Any thoughts on how I should handle a similar situation if it happens again? So the news literally deliberately putting out something that they know is not the case. Yeah. Because what? Because they want to well, they have get a headline? Own, they want to get some viewers? Yeah, they have their own agendas around not only that, but politics and stuff as well they could be trying to like stir the pot or whatever like they're they're right. known to to regularly do it and have done it many many times in the past as well but so the question is um that uh, you get all these young people coming into work in journalism and in the media and yeah. i think they have one vision of how they hope it's going to be well and i what think they everybody i think it's human nature in, in a lot of ways to go into something and, and think that you're going to 
change it or or make it better, right? Like I right. think I think a fresh um, young person who is becoming a police officer probably thinks that they're going to to hit the streets and they're going to do it better than everybody else did it. They're going to do it different. They got a fresher perspective and stuff. And then, you know, a couple of years in, realize, oh, hang on. Now I realize why everybody before me did it this way. Because uh, some some things are just the way they are. And it's really, really, really hard to change them sort of thing. Like, like change does come about, but I, I don't know if it... Uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody, you know, like we know or whatever is going to be the, mm. the, the, the key proponent to that. You know what I mean? Like it, it, yeah. it'll happen, but uh, for every time that it happens, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of other people have to suffer through the, 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 the garbage, right. To get to the point mm. where something does happen. So I, I think, my advice I think we should would just have... be to yeah. um, know what you're getting into. I mean, it sounds like you do, but maybe not fully aware of everything that you're you're getting into, and just take it as it comes. You know, you might you might find a spot where you're not carrying the dirty water, like uh, you know, like your colleagues have said to you, or or whatever. You might find yourself in a spot where you are, and it's too much, and it's time to leave to go somewhere else think, within the same industry or people, you know reimagine what it, you're going to be doing with your life like it's nothing set it in depends, stone doesn't it right I, I think when you're new and fresh like you said like and, and high-minded with your you know morals and your principles you've got these ideas that everything should be better and it should be yeah. because obviously every time you make lies in the press the that 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 just justifies the the the, the Russian or the, the other end, you know. They're like, well, these guys are just lying, so why don't we lie as well? And sure. you know, it, it exacerbates itself a and it gives people to the excuses bottom. a race to, be bad, to the right? bottom. And also, if you're publishing things, you know, that are wrong, that that does that is that is that is wrong, definitely. Yeah. And I I feel like, but as you said, as the guy in the email said, it's not his decision, and he has to eat the shit. And to some extent, maybe you do, but to some extent, you don't want to be the fool guy, right? You don't want to be the guy that gets, you know, oh, well, you know, we're blaming, you know, the, the scapegoat, yeah. you know, the, the guy that, because at the bottom, that's what happens. You know, you're going to you're gonna get the sack if, if it all is, you know, it, you're going to be, the guys who told you to do it aren't going to get in trouble, no. you know, no. because they'll be like, well, it was your decision. You were the journalist. You put your name on it, whatever. Right, you know? right. uh, so, so you've got to be careful, I think, always, but. That's I why you just got to keep uh, folders on all the people that you interact with, you know? <laughs> Follow them after work and see what they get up to and and keep some some bribery material ready for when they do inevitably throw you under the bus and then you could say, "Yeah, but look at this." And you can deflect, you know? You like you you have to have some spicy material yourself. So so get yeah. gathering. Get out there and gather I watched, um, some spicy material. Get your whistles ready this, and get ready <laughs> what to work. I watched I watch this, 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 this documentary about Wirecard, um, which I oh, should yeah. have heard about. Yeah, the German it was, thing, right? It was this German financial tech company who was sort of this big new German PayPal type thing. And they were really Fintech. hugely... They called it they were Fintech. Hu- yeah, they were hugely... The German government and everyone was obsessed because the Germans haven't got this... But they don't really have any modern tech companies you know they're not they're, they're known for old school industry and so when it sort of all came up it was this huge thing that everyone was all excited about and they didn't want it to be a scam but of course it was it was it was a it was all a, a bogus accounting fraud maybe that's why that guy's in prison we don't know. Yeah, I reckon. Um, it was it was definitely like this this thing but the thing is the guys who were running it had like ties to the international you know agencies you know they had like ex- Russian operatives, ex ex Libyan secret agents, you know all these kind of criminals, effectively, yeah. who were un, you know doing very dodgy stuff behind the scenes, trying to keep people shut down and hacking people. And the, the Financial Times, their investigative journalism team, oh, it's really like interesting. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. Yeah, it's a really it was like interesting two story guys, though. and they had to have this like sealed room in the Financial Times where they had a safe with a laptop that wasn't connected to the internet, you know, and. Once they got their documents, they had to go in there every day and trawl through hundreds of thousands of hours of stuff. And they had to have a very small team. And so it just took took forever. And, and all the while they're reporting, every bit of news that they're putting out is being, you know, poo-pooed. And, and uh, in fact, Financial Times was continually sued by Wirecard. So I think, honestly, the future, the, the, in the most modern way possible, I think investigative journalism is it's the hardest place it's ever been, right? 
uh, it's so easy to hide stuff or just spin stuff, you know, away from it being, or just, just like them being attacked, like them not having the, you know, people not really seem to put money behind investigative journalism now, you know, or it not being worth it. You know, everyone's like, oh, we'll, t- we'll take away your advertising. Like it's a, it's a, it's a tough job anyway. Like even some of the people who revealed the Panama Papers were were killed in car bombs yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's terrible. You know, it's like, it's a real shame. So yeah, if you're going into journalism and investigative journalism, good good luck to you. Good luck. man, it's... It's, uh, so you're putting your you're putting your life on the line, really. Crikey! Um, well, I hope that's answered your question and cheered you up on a on a cold and windy morning on the way into your corrupt job. Uh, <laughs> right, kicking kick a, kick a can and staring at the ground, <laughs> wondering what to do next. This is uh, this is from Jack. Uh, uh, old Sips mentioned how happy he was to get a like from Ricky Gervais on Twitter. <laughs> oh, here, Not to piss on his cornflakes oh, or anything, here we but go. I've had three likes from Not him to, in the space uh, of a week. You always know that somebody. He's about to piss on your cornflakes when they open up <laughs> when with they... <laughs> not to piss on his cornflakes. Uh, but the, there's a choice line to describe how Ricky Gervais uh, hands out uh, likes, according to Jack here. He hands them out like a pedophile hands out sweets. Wow. Interesting. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so uh, Jack, Jack managed uh, three likes from Ricky. So uh, I, I think he just likes He's everything. a liker. He's a liker. Oh, well. Uh, this is from Jack. Can't believe I'm typing this email, but this is a serious issue that I feel needs to be addressed. Lewis, this email has nothing to do with you, so sit back and relax, pal. All right? Oh. Are you sitting back and relaxing? No, I'm taking forward This now. guy's about right. to piss like in your cornflakes, Oh, he's a, he's a cornflake pisser. He's pissing on me and Sips' cornflakes. Now, Perrin and Sips, <laughs> when someone starts with now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> when you two were discussing awful musicians to watch live, and I have to agree with you, for the most part, I'd rather eat a pack of crayons than listen to Adele live. Excuse me, I said that I would be happy to watch Adele live. See, that's how I know this guy's email. No, you wait till you hear what Jack says. You guys discussed how horrible it would be to watch Canadian singer-songwriter Michael Bublé live. (laughs) Now, this blatant slander against him is unacceptable, all caps underlined. He is a saint, according to Jack. I agree with you, gentlemen, about most things, but to badmouth, Buble is sacrilege. Uh, I appreciate everyone has an opinion, but both of yours is wrong. Okay. I shan't hear another bad word said about this man, and I demand that this week's big ups go to Michael Buble. Yes, no, I, okay, but listen, I, I, there's a rabbit <laughs> hole that you could go down if you're interested, where Michael Buble is potentially abusing his wife, like like uh, domestically abusing <laughs> oh his wife. Oh my god! Wow. And there's been a lot of work to cover it up as well. Like, go. <laughs> Have fun is all I'm Sips saying to you. Secretly an investigative journalist. Yeah, he's got well, his lost, now that we've like, been speaking about it, I'm not going to say anything, any, anything more. I'm not accusing or whatever because I think Bublé's got some pretty powerful people. But if you're interested, <laughs> there is a nice rabbit hole for you to go down. Uh, enjoy. No big up for Bublé. Sorry. Yes, no big up for Bublé indeed. Although. Jack then does say, I'm willing to strike a deal with you, gents. If this week's big ups go to Buble, then he will donate £10 to a charity of our choice. All right, I've got one for you. How about £10 goes to uh, the Survivors of Domestic Violence charity, a women's shelter charity, and then we'll give a big up to Buble. There you go. Ten pounds to that, please. Not that I have any idea if that story's true. No. But you know what? I fucking hate Buble, so I can imagine it. Also, Jack sent that from his work email, so you know he's serious. That's so funny. God bless you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Oh, man. Oh, that was a good one. That oh, was a good that's one. good. That right. was good. I kind of, I'm watching these Buble Instagram videos now. <laughs> yeah. They're a couple of years old. I've gone down the rabbit hole since. Oh, no. And he's like, he's like doing like, he's like elbowing her. and like, Yes. He says to her, I'm going to kill you at one point. <laughs> I don't know. Like, that's not the kind of thing like you say to your wife, is it? It's not very Buble-like behavior, is it? <laughs> I'm not feeling very Christmas spirit. I'm not feeling very jazzy right now with, the, with that. Yeah, Fuck, holy he's got shit. a syrupy voice, but he's probably a prick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, this is from uh, a guy whose nickname, his name is Jacob Ducky. You, you never know anyone, do you? No. You no, never. you really don't. This holy is shit. Jacob Ducky voicing. How do you think he got the nickname Ducky? Um, Ducky. Uh, it sounds like a, like an aristocracy thing, right? Like uh, that is kind of a nickname that they would give to somebody, right? Well, oh, he's oh, uh, he's in, he's on deployment in the British Navy. He's right. in the Royal Navy. Sorry, right. seven and a half months away. 
He listened to a fair chunk of our back catalogue while while he's off. Uh, he started watching Seinfeld. There's a lot of time on board ship, I guess. So he's Holy watching crap, Seinfeld, yeah. loves sure. it. Yeah. Already binged the first season in a day. Busy, yeah. are you, Jake? No, the first hell. season of Seinfeld is <laughs> like uh, eight episodes, though. It's like, yeah, a, pi- like a pilot uh, season. All right, so here we go. Well, I, I, like, he, he, it's just a shout out for the recommendation. But I, I thought that this was interesting. Jacob Ducky voicing. Yeah. Why do you think it's Ducky? It's not because he's posh. Right. Um, I, I'm at a loss then. I don't know. Ducky because is... voicing sounds like hoisin. Oh. Like hoisin sauce. So that is such a weak reason to have the nickname Ducky. No offense, Ducky, but <laughs> voicing? I, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I just thought that was funny. I, I, in terms of bad nicknames that really that don't make sense, that's up there. That is really, really funny. I can... <laughs> I, that is so loose. <laughs> so <That's>... weak. <laughs> <laughs> Voicing, what, like hoisin sauce? What, like they put on ducks? We'll call him <laughs> Ducky. So funny. Anyways. Nice. Uh, hello, Perian Lewis and Sips. I was listening to number 235 while on my mail route, as usual, and was fascinated to hear about this gathering of the Nigels that a pub hosts. According yeah. to Lewis, the, the youngest Nigel they found is in his 40s. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This made me realize I may be incredibly rare, as I am a 25 year old American Nigel. No way. I have never met or even heard of someone else knowing another Nigel, which I'd always attributed to just being American, but it sounds like that's becoming common even in the UK. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, you're, you're, you're more likely to find a Nigel in the UK, I would say. Uh, than anywhere else in the world. Listen, but- you should consider a name change. You're young, you know. That's Nigel's going to follow you around your whole life. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not got good associations here, dude. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, you know, think how think you could be called anything. You could be called like Flash. Um, well, it's funny you talk like- about name changes because allow me to continue. Dennis. Edward. I wanted to see if you guys would set this next bit up. It's perfect. Well, Bruce. the most obvious problem with being an American Bruce. Nigel is that oh, approximately every name, other eh? person I've ever Bruce. met in my entire life has asked me in a bad British accent, like Nigel Thornbury. I don't know who's <laughs> Nigel Thornbury. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> Nigel Thornbury. Uh, oh, oh he's from the host of Nigel Thornbury's Wild World. Oh. He's one of the characters of the Wild Thornberrys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never yeah. seen it. Smashing. Sorry. Uh, never Nigel seen it. Thornberry. <laughs> I don't know. Is British. it a kid's show? It's a kid's show from the looks yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got the big teeth and he's like, it's like a classic toffee-nosed kind well, of The rareness character. of my name has presented another issue. As Nigel is a trans woman, and you're all exactly right that Nigella, which is something we talked about, is a horrible name. Yeah. Many other trans women get to go Michael to Michelle, Joseph to Josephine, but Nigella, Nigella is simply not an option for obvious reasons. However, yeah. I don't want to change it to anything else because I feel I have to carry the Nigel torch. So we you have, don't. <laughs> well, what about just shortening Nigel it? Don't sacrifice yourself for this. Don't, don't die on that hill. Just get a we new said name. that Nigella was a bad name. So Nigel is going to keep the name Nigel. I think the proof is in the pudding with Nigella. How many Nigellas have you ever met in your life? Well, I only know of one. Yeah, me too. I I think that any female version of a male name that's less like it goes the other way too, though, right? Like there's certain names that are more female, and then there's a male Geraldine. version of them, right? Geraldine's sure. a good name. I quite like that. A, a, and Gerald. it's a strong feminine name, isn't it? I think it Geraldine. is. Yeah, yeah. Do you imagine a Geraldine with like ten children? Still does her fucking laundry on like oh. a washboard. Can like bench press all of her kids at once if she and needs Brooks, to. And Brooks, Brooks, no argument and stands on, stands, accepts Stan, no foolishness. Stands next to a clothing line with her arms crossed, stern face for every photo that she ever is has taken Roll, of Rolly her. hanging out the side of her mouth. Well, yeah. boy, I better get this washing in then before <laughs> weather turns to piss. Unbelievable. Yeah. You kids pick that up after yourselves and tell your dad <laughs> dinner's going to be ready in 20 bloody minutes. If he's not here, if he's down pub or fucking bookies again, he's getting out. You tell him. Have you finished mucking out horses? Muck out that bloody horse. They call it, <laughs> they call it shoveling up. That's what they call it, shoveling up. Sho- shovel up. Oh, shoveling up. Shovel uh, that shit. Shovel it. I, th- I, think, I think it is like... Uh, a, a thing where it feels like a lazy name, right? Or or the fe- like the Nigella. I guess I don't associate it with Nigel too closely. Actually, it's not no. too bad. It's not obvious. The same I think, thing I like think Louis. it's very telling, though, isn't it? That a lot of female names are essentially they just stick a l or an uh on the end or an een or Bruce an L because they're like, well, it turns out we've had a girl. Well, oh. 
Alanis. Call her, call her I think if they've Michaela. got a different sound, they're okay. Like Lu- Louise is obviously the female version of, of yeah. Louis. For me, it's, or it's Louis. Christine or maybe Chrissy. Chris, Chrissy. Yeah. Christine? I don't think if Christine is necessarily Christa? a bad a bad one either. Crystal. Crystal is okay. Crystal. You are starting to sound like a stripper though. Yeah, um, Crystal is a stripper name. I've, I've got yeah. one here. This is the, I, I guess we're going to finish on this one because this will be the hour mark. And this is uh, from Edward. Uh, which is a cracking name. Well done, yeah. Edward. Uh, please read this in your best British railway nerd voice. Okay, all right. Uh, Lewis recently talked about being of suitable age to love trains. I'm 30 <laughs> years old, dual nationality, and I love American trains. My great-grandfather <laughs> on my mum's side worked for the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, <laughs> and my grandfather has a huge steam locomotive fan. <laughs> My dad has a huge model railroad based on the Great Northern Railroad in the USA, so I had no chance of being cool way before birth. American <laughs> trains are gigantic. I recently visited a railroad museum in Portland, Oregon, and after chatting with the volunteers, they let me sit in the engineer's, the engineer's chair of SP hashtag 4449, which is a beautifully restored steam engine in a very striking colour scheme. It still runs excursions and requires maintenance every day to keep it running. My partner and I stood next to the large drive wheels, and they're taller in diameter than me. I'm six foot tall. This locomotive was also used in the 1986 movie Tough Guys with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas. For some reason, the Red Hot Chili Peppers are in it too. This movie. We also had a tour of a naval submarine called USS Blueback, which was used for breaching shots in the hunt for Red October, probably more interesting to you, period. Ships might be impressed by the feat of engineering of the largest steam train ever made, called the Union Pacific Big Boy, which has 16 gigantic driver wheels in a 4884 configuration. It's also very heavy at 350 kilograms. It can bend a buckle railroad track and once fatally crashed at 50 miles an hour. There's also a big fan club for American model trains called the NMRA. My dad is a current president of the British region, the MRA, and they desperately need young blood, which is anyone under 60. Many yeah. thanks. Apologies for the unusually dry email, but I'd be doing the global train fan community a disservice by inserting humour. No, no, good good for you. Honestly, there's a lot of things like this like uh, recently that like there's a snooker club close to uh, like like a community snooker club, like close to where I live. And uh, they just celebrated like 100 years of being open a uh, snooker club or whatever but their memberships are down big time because nobody wants to play snooker anymore so they're trying to get younger people in to do it much like you guys are trying to get people interested in trains or whatever a lot of this stuff is dying out right it comes back to what we were saying before about too many games to play too many movies to watch too many tv shows to watch but, but so i think it's interesting when people think these things are dying out i will say this the key to things becoming cool again is that they have almost died out and then some young hipster that's famous and has a million instagram followers says Guys, if you heard of something called trains, they're unbelievable. No, nah, yeah, that but do? I think it, I think what a lot of, of this sudden, stuff is interested the, in trains. There's a, there's a correlation to the changes in the way that we socialize. I think with a lot of this stuff, I don't think train it, enthusiasts socialize. I think they do. I think only they, with other train enthusiasts. It's a it's problem. a physical thing that you have to displace yourself and go somewhere to see somebody's setup or whatever, or you'd have to go to like a, a model railway show or like a you know an expo or something like you know right, what I mean. But like only these are mingling all, with other train enthusiasts. That's my point. Sure, but these people all have to gather up somewhere to look at these train model train sets, right? You can't just like you can't take your entire thing just round to Jimmy's house and wait. Uh, is this is this feasible? Feeding back into your theory that people don't leave the house and as yes. much as they used to. They, I still they, don't think that's they true. They definitely don't, though. Like, uh, and I think it's the same with like uh, like snooker and stuff as well. Younger people, I don't think, leave the house as much as they I, used to. I don't to. think that's true. I really don't. I'd be interested to, to find out. But I'm looking at this. The if Wikipedia you try, try leaving the this. house at the fucking weekend in London and you will, actually, you will not be able to move two feet without bumping into a horde of people. I actually think it might be the opposite. Like when we think people are dying, I think if we spoke to the world snooker people, they probably say like snooker is the biggest it's ever been. I it's think, certainly like, very I, big yeah, in China, right? It, should, it probably is, but I, I'm 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 more th- saying like you I know, think a lot a of things are the biggest they've ever been because level, you know? because these little niche things are are now in having a chance to grow. Like I think you can have these communities around like very small games, very small. And as much as we complain about it, and there's like all the uh, people conspiracy nuts have their own echo chambers where they you know circle around the craziness. But there's obviously like communities that have been been really fostered look at this wikipedia article for the union pacific big boy it's giving me like excitement it's got a four foot eight and a half inch 
standard gauge period. It's got, it's got a leading diameter of 36 inches oh, and a wheelbase baby. of 72 oh, yeah. feet and five and a half inches. Keep, keep Oof, going. Keep which going. is 22.9 metres. So close. It's an axle load oh, of yeah. 67,000 pounds, which is mm. 30,000 kilograms. There's an adhesive weight of 245,000 kilos. Jesus. Uh, the, of course, the total weight is uh, 539,000 kilos. Well, naturally. The fuel type is yeah. coal, converted yeah. to from number four... Sorry, it's number 4014 coal, which is converted to number five... A bit problematic uh, in the current... Uh climate uh called powering it things consumes coal. 11 tons of coal per hour oh, and baby. twelve oh, okay. thousand no gallons that's of water why that thing has been sidelined i, I see yeah, now why that's crazy it's got a 150 square foot firebox leading into a 95 inch boiler which Jesus. has got 300 pounds per foot per inch squared boiler pressure well i'll tell you <laughs> who's enjoyed this edward <laughs> me. Our, our I, this is fantastic edward. there you go get oh. into it I, I, I have think to go, chat, so I've got trains. to make a phone call. I apologize. Right, it's well, come, something's come up. Best of luck. And these, uh, keep the I'm, emails coming. God these bless. are some good ones. More some train really good stuff. Ones. More <laughs> yes, train stuff. Please, please. No, more Can train we stuff. have a whole episode about train stuff? That'd be great. Oh my god, we'd have to get a specialist oh on. Uh, yeah, I don't know enough about trains. You guys don't know anything about trains. We'd just be reading train. It's fucking uh, I'm specs interested off the to internet. know though. I'm oh, interested I see one to of them was learn. converted to fuel oil. Right. right well, Lewis is going to be here all day. What's the 4884? What's the White's notation for Steve We're Locomotive's stop wheel? Right here. This was <laughs> this week's Drive me. Force podcast I need, mailbag I need special. To understand I'm in more hell. About trains. We will see you guys next time. <laughs> <All> right, bye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>